extended mission of a, a magnetospheric uh, mission that was originally called Themis. Uh, at the end of uh, that prime mission, we took two of these probes uh, from uh, Earth orbits and we took them out to these lunar orbits, which uh, you can see here if I can get this pointer to work. Uh, okay, it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, slow, but here we go. Uh, these are the kind of orbits that they're in right now. These are just uh, snapshots three months apart showing you how these orbits work. They're highly elliptical. Um, one of them is prograde and one is retrograde, so you can see they precess around it uh, at different speeds, and you get all sorts of interesting uh, interspace craft separations and geometries here, which are very useful for doing some of the science that we're doing. Uh, the Artemis mission uh, has very comprehensive uh, plasma instrumentation because Themis was a plasma physics mission. Uh, so we measure pretty much everything there is to, uh, to know about the plasma, from the, the thermal ions and electrons up to the energetic ions and electrons, and then the full suite of fields, um, from DC electric and magnetic fields all the way up to high frequencies. And here's just some snapshots, uh, family portrait of the instruments. Um, one thing that we unfortunately do not measure on Artemis is the ion mass composition. Uh, and that's, uh, that's really too bad, um, but you'll see that we're still able to recover some science on things like pickup ions. Um, so let's just dive ahead. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm not going to try and cover everything that Artemis is doing because it's a very long list. Um, I'm not going to cover things like solar wind turbulence or magnetotail physics or even a topic near and dear to my heart like the lunar wake um, another time. Uh, instead, I'm going to try and focus a little bit on the topic of uh, the effects that the, uh, the moon has on the plasma environment around it. Um, so I'll just show a little cartoon here. It's a, it's a simplified version of a cartoon that I've showed many times over the year, but I want to make the point once again, the moon uh, is not just a quiescent object from the perspective of the plasma. It's not so quiet and boring. Um, you might think it's just a big rock that sits there in the sky, um, but actually, uh, it's in the solar wind a lot of the time or in the magnetospheric plasma. As that plasma flows by, it creates a downstream wake. So here's a big disturbed region in the plasma over here. Um, the moon, as we know, also has a tenuous atmosphere. Portions of that atmosphere get ionized and they get swept up in the magnetic and electric fields of the flowing plasma uh, and they form these big cycloidal pickup ion trajectories. Um, this whole region here, uh, the moon and its atmosphere, uh, its charged surface, the wake, uh, forms disturbances that propagate along the field lines. And in particular, electrons are very mobile. And they can move outward along the field lines um, from this region. Uh, and they can, they can be seen at very large distances from the moon. Finally, we know that the moon has small regions of crustal magnetic fields. And what we've recently learned is that uh, incoming plasma ions reflect very well from these magnetic fields. Up to 50% of the solar wind can reflect. And these guys go spiraling off into the interplanetary medium uh, where we can see them with Artemis. And now here we're out here with Artemis at sometimes tens of thousands of kilometers from the moon. Um, but we can measure the influence of the moon. And we can trace these effects back, um, in some cases, to meters from the surface. Uh, so it's actually it's a really cool set of observations. Let me show you uh, some more of that. I want to start by talking about pickup ions. Um, this is something that, uh, that I wrote into the Artemis proposal and that I hope we'd be able to do, but I was never sure uh, how well we'd be able to see these things. Anyway, this is kind of the cartoon view. Um, these constituents of the atmosphere get ionized and they get swept out in these big looping cycloidal trajectories. And the idea is that even though we don't have mass composition, because of the way that these separate, um, the larger masses bend slower, the lighter masses bend faster. Um, by looking at the angular information and where we see these, we can say something about what they are. Um, here's what the data actually looks like in the solar wind. Um, this is as a function of time, and the bright color is the flux. This big red blob here is the solar wind. And here's the pickup ions up here. Uh, seen in the two different probes, forming this very narrow feature in energy. Looking at angles, it's also very narrow in angle. Uh, and you can see, boy, it's hard to actually tell what species these are. Um, you can look at it in a more statistical way and look at, uh, at where they're all going as compared to some, uh, some typical trajectories for different species. Uh, and again, it's a bit of a smear. If you move these things around, you can kind of, kind of say that things are, are consistent with a mass range of around 15 to perhaps 40 or 50. Um, but doing much more than that is hard in the solar wind because these trajectories are very large. Um, it turns out that in the magneto sheath, uh, the magnetic field is larger and things, uh, the trajectories bend a little bit faster and we can get some better separation. 
So this is a, an example of an observation in the magneto sheet. And you can see that now this is a velocity distribution. This, again, is, is the solar wind beam here. And you can see a couple of different components to the pickup ions here. You can also see this in, this, uh, in the spectrogram format down here. And so now we can actually start to say something about the different species and or different origins of these things. So we got really brave, and uh, we decided to try and fit all this data to a source model. Uh, and of course, we didn't try and uh, fit it to a source model with every species in the atmosphere. Instead, we just kind of uh, tried to separate things into a few large mass bins. Uh, and I'm showing those here, the six different mass bins. And these are the distributions of the, the neutral source atoms now that, that we came up with. Um, and I've put some tentative labels up here for, for what species might be important in those bins. But you should really think, these, think of these as a superposition of a bunch of different things. Um, the contours show our coverage of those different species. That's very good, starting from the surface and extending up to thousands of kilometers uh, for source locations that we can see, except for helium. We don't really get good coverage of helium, so we don't include it in our model. Uh, so we came up with a, with a nice model here. And it actually it fit pretty well with what we thought we knew about the exosphere in terms of, of measured constituents and upper limits to what might be there. Um, and then LRO had to go and come out with new upper limits much more stringent upper limits on a bunch of species. Uh, and now, suddenly, we're very puzzled as to what we're actually seeing with Artemis. So here's a, a big table, which I don't expect you to completely digest. Um, but what you're seeing here is the five different mass bins that we fit uh, this particular Artemis observation to. These are some species that live in those mass bins. Uh, and these are the surface density limits from Cook et al. or from, from the older Stern et al. and references therein. Uh, and this is the density we'd need to fit the pickup ion fluxes in that mass bin um, if it was all from one particular species. And what you'll see is that, that, gosh, these numbers are a lot bigger than these numbers in almost all cases. Don't worry too much about this low mass bin. That's only a few percent of the pickup ion flux, so I don't make too much of that. But once we get up into the oxygen mass bin, you can see we have a pretty big discrepancy here. A factor of 1,000 uh, more oxygen would be needed to explain our observations if that was all that there was. Um, but uh, there's some other possibilities. There's exotic things like methane or hydroxyl, um, which uh, are actually allowed by the limits, but would be somewhat surprising if they were there in those densities. Uh, in the sodium mass bin, we actually know that sodium is there, and it can actually give us the flux we need. Yay. Uh, but then we go up into the next mass bin, uh, and things get bad again, because the aluminum limit went way, 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 way down. Even a little aluminum gives you uh, a lot of pickup ions, but the LRO observations say there's not a lot there. Finally, in the top mass bin, um, argon can do it, but the argon limit keeps going down and down and down. So we're actually starting to get a little worried there. Now, there are a lot of ways out of this, this conundrum. Um, there may be spatial variations. LRO is looking on the night side. We're looking on the day side, effectively. There may be species not on this list. Uh, but there's a puzzle here, and we really need uh, Laddie to help us out with this. Um, just to emphasize that it's not just Artemis that uh, uh, is coming up with puzzling conclusions about the pickup ions. Here's some older measurements from wind, and actually a not so old measurement from Kaguya. And you can see some interesting things here, like a huge signal from oxygen, uh, again in the Kaguya, some oxygen and carbon. Um, very surprising given that the limits on carbon and oxygen now are into, uh, into the single digits for density. Um, so there's really something interesting going on here, and uh, we really need to see what Laddie's going to tell us. Um, let's go into one final environment, which is the tail lobe of the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, here, there's actually basically no ambient plasma. There's just pickup ions. Um, Andrew Poppy has been doing a, a, a wonderful job of trying to model what might be going on there. And you can see the really interesting distributions that you get there, because the, uh, the surface field of the moon is actually almost as important as the convection electric field now. Um, but he's coming up with basically the same conclusions that I did in the solar wind. Um, what he's finding is that if you take these, these Cook uh, upper limits and you forward model them, um, you don't get anywhere close to what we see with Artemis. Um, we know that there's sodium and potassium there. That's somewhere down here. It doesn't get you up to the Artemis measurement or even the noise floor. If you take the Cook et al. upper limits and add them all up, it also only gets you something like 20% of the Artemis noise floor. Um, and so there's, there's something there that we don't understand that's causing a lot of pickup ions. So there's a big yes, puzzle right. here that left. we have to answer. Yeah, I'm running out of time already. OK. Um, I knew that was going to happen. Even if you only try and cover one topic, you run out of time. Uh, I'll be quick. Um, 
I just want to make a, make a couple of points. One is that uh, there are some environments where plasma from the moon actually dominates over the ambient plasma. That was a big surprise to me, and I think it's pretty exciting. Um, and it's not just in, in unique environments like the tail lobe that the moon has a big effect. Um, out in the solar wind, the, the reflected uh, protons have a huge effect on the upstream magnetic field. You can see these huge waves that are caused there. Um, so the, the lunar plasma environment uh, is a really exciting uh, thing, and we can actually take these plasma signals and we can trace them back and we can learn what's happening um, right in the moon and its atmosphere and near the charged surface. Um, finally, just a sales pitch slide to, uh, to finish off here. Artemis and Laddie and LRO are actually just a wonderful team to study this because together we can measure um, everything of interest. Laddie and LRO can measure the, uh, the atmosphere and the dust in situ, and we measure both the inputs and the outputs of the system. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to what we can do with uh, these three spacecraft there together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jasper. Wonderful talk. That's just great. Well, we don't have any uh, um, any questions quite yet in uh, in chat. Um, maybe I'll start off by uh, by asking what's uh, what's the future for uh, Artemis? What uh, what specific goals do you uh, have coming up? Well, first and foremost, um, we want to uh, coordinate with Laddie. I mean, Laddie being up there is going to be really exciting because uh, they'll be actually, hopefully, not just telling us what's not there in the atmosphere, but what is there in the atmosphere. And by comparing that to what we're seeing with Artemis, I think we might actually get closer to understanding um, how, how this environment around the moon is actually behaving. And that's, that's extremely exciting to me. Uh, the Artemis orbits are, are very stable, and, and those spacecraft are going to be there for a while. So we're looking forward to many more years of data and, and coordination with the other missions that are there. Great, great. OK. So uh, um, there, I see that there's someone uh, typing right now. I'm just going to give them a, a few seconds. No, they, they stopped. So, uh, so I tell you what, I will let them um, type their question in general, Chad, and maybe you could, uh, you could take a look at that if you wouldn't mind. So thanks again. Um, really great talk and uh, such an interesting and, and uh, innovative mission. That, that was uh, really enjoyed that.